Thank you very much for being here with us today. Um, I am um, going to just take a minute to introduce Women for Afghan Women to you. Um, Women for Afghan Women is a women's human rights organization, and I've just started um, its activities in Washington, D.C. this February. Uh, and uh, Women for Afghan Women operates um, 27 offices in 10 provinces of Afghanistan and also has a community center in New York. And as I said, we are new in D.C. Um, and this panel discussion focusing on um, uh, elections in Afghanistan, but through a gender lens, I hope is the first of many other um, uh, uh, panels and discussions that events that Women for Afghan Women will have focusing on, on gender. Um, so we, I'm sorry also to tell you that um, Dr. Simo Samara was not well. Um, she was in New York, but she, she wasn't well and not able to join us today. Uh, but we are lucky to have some very distinguished panelists here joining us. Um, and I also want to um, uh, thank the, uh, our co-sponsors for this event. We could have not had this event without them. Um, and I want to thank the Peace and Security Funders Group's Women Peace and Security Working Group and the Henrik Ball Stiffing North America Group and also New America Foundation. Um, and I will ask Ambassador Samad to introduce our speakers now. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a bit early probably uh, given Washington's habits of starting discussions later in the day and even into the evening. But that's why we have coffee for you outside, and I, I hope you did get some coffee. Um, we are going to, before I, I introduce the panelists here in the room, we're going to go straight to Jalalabad, Afghanistan. And we have, I'm hoping, on the line, uh, a good friend and a very important advocate for women's rights in Afghanistan, uh, Ms. Mahbuba Saraj. And she... Uh, has been kind enough to accept our invitation to speak to you about her observations, her observations during the past few weeks, before elections took place, during election, and, and now, uh, post-election, uh, even though the electoral process is still underway in Afghanistan, and we still are not totally done with the first round, if there is going to be a second round. So I will... Uh, initially, because we do not want to lose the line to Jalalabad, uh, go to Mabuba and uh, ask her first of all if she can hear us. Yes, I can. Very good. I can hear you. Nice to have you with us. Uh, I will pass the mic to you, if you would, uh, and, uh, and uh, ask you to give us, first of all, your sense of how elections went. Uh, both in terms of right. preparations for elections and in terms of the way they were conducted and what is happening now. So, uh, you know, since you're on the ground, give us a feel, take us on the ground, and, and uh, we would then uh, ask the audience before we let you go to maybe ask what, a question or two, and then we will turn back to the panel here. Your turn, Mahu Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Hello, everybody. I'm uh, really pleased to be here, and I just hope that you can hear my voice well. Um, the, some of us, we call this election of Afghanistan our Camelot. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, uh, as, the, as the people of Afghanistan, the men and women, we are extremely, extremely proud of, of uh, what we actually achieved um, in that day in this country. Um, actually, what we we make history, to tell you the honest truth, because uh, I believe that it was something that we all did, which cannot be uh, taken away from us, nor can it be unlearned from now on. This is something we all learned. This is something we all pra practice, and hopefully, from here on, we are going to take it to much higher um, stages in our lives. Um, in the day of the election, I mean, the, the few days, the few weeks before that, it was, you know, pretty hectic and people were running around and, and, and having their, you know, gatherings all over Afghanistan. But in the day of the election, um, Kabul was, was really, because that's where I am, and it was really very beautiful because it was kind of raining in the morning 
and it was very, very quiet because there was nobody on the streets and everybody was off to, to go and, and give their votes. And uh, I started my day at 6 o'clock in the morning because at 8 o'clock I was supposed to be with Radio Plead and they were doing um, interviews with all of the, or actually they were connected with um, with all of the um the different uh, centers, voting centers, all over Afghanistan, and they were asking them about, you know, whether they have received all of their equipment, how the voting is going, whether the people are there, whether the phones are there, and what is going on. So I spent about two hours there. So I actually really did get a very good picture of uh, how the election was going on all over Afghanistan. Um, in some areas, there were problems, uh, and everybody kept on saying that the the participation of women um, was absolutely amazing, and everyone was was very very happy, and we were all very happy. You know, when we were hearing that, I was um, you know really happy, um, especially when we heard that in Kandahar, you know, in Helmand, um, women were out and they were they were voting. Uh, I cannot tell you how. Uh, how exciting all of that was. Uh, Kabul city was was uh, unbelievable, um, the amount of participation. And then after I finished the two hours of the of the radio plead, then I went to the different voting um, places in Kabul, and I went mostly to Korte Se and Korte Char. And uh, it was wonderful. It really was wonderful. Um, the areas where I went, there was not really that many long lines, I should say. There were lines, but they were not as long as the uh, Habibia High School, for example, um, in, in Kabul. But the rest was really, you know, people were going, people were, were voting. And, and, and then when they were coming out, I asked a few of them, you know, uh, whom they have voted for. And, 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 you know, some of them were saying that, you know, it's their secret, but some of them were kind of sharing it with me. And, and it was, um, it was, it was a, I call it, it was a magical day. Um, it was a day for all of us to be, for me, I, again, I was very proud um, to be, to be an Afghan woman born and raised in this country. Um, then after the election, of course, um, then the, you know, the countings and all of that, I mean, after a while when, when all of the boxes came back, uh, the ballot boxes came back to the election committee, uh, commission, then they all started to count it. So now we are going through the process of counting. And of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, corruption that has been going on and, uh, and, you know, in, in, in some or in most or in some, I guess, of these, of these voting, um, stations. Uh, especially in the areas when it was not very secure to vote, uh, a lot of things. That's why a lot of the voting places in those areas were closed. But then again, it was in the same areas that uh, a lot of the, the corruption did take place. So, um, so then, you know, the counting started of the votes, and uh, and then the first uh, round came out, and then they they told us about the last, you know, the two winners that they are. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah and Dr. Ashraf Ghani, and the third one being Zalmay Rasul with 11%, and then and then uh, Sayyaf Seth, and then after that um, Hilal Seth, which are the the main ones. Um, uh, uh, but now, um, as 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 uh, I don't know if you know or not, but the but the election in Afghanistan, um, the election c uh, commission, um, the the law says that they have to win at the first round. Uh, they ha should have uh, 50 plus one of all of the uh, votes in Afghanistan, which um, I don't know. I don't. The, the, it looks like it might not happen. So Afghanistan is going to go to the second round, and the second round is is the second round of an election, and it's something that you know. Uh, happens not only here, but it happens in some other countries in the world also. So uh, as long as we can all accept it and and go with the process, um, I believe I believe we are going to be we are going to be fine, hopefully. Because I what I see I see a a change, um, a very very fundamental change. Um, right now, uh, it, it, the most amazing thing is actually that uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah and uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani won votes from all over Afghanistan. Um, maybe Dr. Ashraf Ghani because his votes were from the soon side of Afghanistan and there were not a big concentration of population in those areas in order for him to get more votes, got lesser amount of votes. At the same time, as far as votes are concerned, everybody got um 
you know, all the all the, the, the everybody, in other words, voted for every one of them, for the, for both of them. In other words, uh, the question of ethnicity, the question of um, who these guys are, are from, the, where they are from, and who they are representing, um, is not. Uh, I mean, uh, as far as the the uh, ethnicities, or as far as the tribes, as far as the language is concerned, is not really that much of a of a concern, and for the men and the women of Afghanistan at this point. Um, um, however, the people of Afghanistan, I know afterwards when I've talked to them, uh, there is a certain, um, how shall I say, um, an air or some kind of a, that they all are kind of, you know, really um, don't want to have anything to do with the warlords if possible, if, if it could be that they could go on with their lives without or with lesser, you know, influence from them, how happy they will be. But then, you know, we have to see what the, what the result of the election is going to bring to all of us. Um, the women in Afghanistan, from the very beginning, we started being extremely uh, proactive towards the whole election, uh, because what we did was that in the beginning, the uh, AWN, which is the Afghan Women Network, decided to have um, meetings with all of the candidates, um, for with all of the 11 of them at that time. And we met with every single one of them, and we asked them about their agenda. What do they want to do for the for the women of Afghanistan? Um, uh, where we actually fit in their in their whole um, um, you know plan for the for the country? And and we we took their uh, we we recorded and we took all of their uh, commitments of how they wanted to deal with us um, if they were the winners. And then at the later point, we actually, AWN also went and had a, a broadcast of, the, of, uh, of interviews, uh, which we were planning to have it at that time with the, with, the, with the ones that they were kind of, you know, ahead of the game, which was uh, we invited um, um, Dr. Fenzal Mai Rasul, we invited uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, and we invited Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, uh, and, and some other, uh, other candidates as well. Um, but then, uh, and that day, only Dr. Sabah Ashraf Ghani showed up with, um, with uh, Daoud Sultan Zoe, Mr. Daoud Sultan Zoe, and that was the only two that came because the rest of them, they were very busy uh, doing their campaign in the provinces of Afghanistan. So, um, Afghanistan's uh, women's main concern at this point with the candidates and with the, um, uh, you know, um, the, the future president of Afghanistan is for us to make sure that whatever we have gained in the past 13, 14 years in Afghanistan is not going one, one millimeter back. Um, this is the number one, number one, the most and the, uh, you know, the biggest concern because Afghanistan has seen this kind of, a, you know, going backwards in our history. Uh, and we really uh, do not want to, you know, do that again. So um, this time we would like to hold on to our place and from here on, you know, keep on going. And, and mostly what we really would like to do, um, all of our achievements and what we want our government to do, uh, partly is going to be based on the 1325, you know, the, uh, um, the, the United Nations Security Council, um, you know, um, um, that, that, you know, they asked the world and you know, for the countries that were in war or after war, how it should be done. And we, and that, um, we, uh, what we ask our government is really to, to have more women in the decision making positions in Afghanistan, um, to have, uh, um, women in the, in the, um, Supreme Court, uh, to, uh, women are really, really working, uh, very, very hard. And we're all, you know, I guess the people of Afghanistan should be doing that as far as corruption is concerned. Because if we don't take care of all of these problems, then I do not believe that, um, we will be really going, you know, much forward. So, so these are the things that we, as far as education is concerned, we have asked the, the, the candidates, you know, to give us their, their, um, you know, commitment to, to education, to our political participation, to the um, uh, to security, to peace and security, and to, for us to have more uh, more contribution to the to the peace and security process in Afghanistan, and for us to be more involved in it. So, so now we are actually waiting to see what is going to be the result of the election. 
and finally, and then hopefully Afghanistan will will go on doing what they need to do, and uh, as far as you know, taking the nation forward, and and for our, and from the world, uh, what we really would like to have, as as always. Um, uh, not forgetting Afghanistan and not stopping the aid. Uh, I know, I know maybe this is not going to sound a very, how shall I say, maybe it's not a very attractive phrase to say now, you know, that please don't do this and please give us more money, please release that. That's, you know, but, but I hope that everybody understands that uh, the, the reason we are asking for it is really, really a question of, of, of Afghanistan and this region's life and death. It's literally like that because Afghanistan cannot and should not uh, go back to to be in the place uh, financially and economically and and as far as the development is concerned that will become another hub or another little haven for you know for the for the negative forces of the world to come and just you know uh, take a little. Um, their little houses in there and just, just stay there and stop working, you know, to destroy the world from here. This, this really should not be allowed. And in order for that not to be allowed, we have to, we have to work towards, you know, giving more jobs to, to our young. Uh, the young generation of Afghanistan is the most, uh, uh, how shall I say, is the most energetic, is the most intelligent. They are absolutely, they have so much hope and they have so much energy and they have so much talent. And, and these people should be really pushed forward in order for them to, you know, to get involved in the in making of Afghanistan. The one thing I want to tell you, which is really very interesting, at the time this uh, um, a, a presidential election in Afghanistan, as you all may know, uh, takes place with the provincial council members, um, um, you know, election. And, and going all over now, as I'm starting this trip all over Afghanistan that I'm going to be going because I am training um, all of the government officials and everybody on the 1325. Uh, we are um, I'm traveling all over, and, and you'll be amazed how many young people have actually um, uh, nominated themselves or were candidates for the for the. Uh, um, the provincial council, and 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 also, I have a belief that one of the reasons why there was such a big turnout of of people, men and women, in the election, is because of this very young energy that was there, and they were there at the forefront, and they needed to get the votes of all of these people. So they really they really did a lot of work in this area in order to to make it very you know interesting for everybody. So I hope that's why you know the um, from the 12 million people actually uh, got their um, nominated and then were, were ready to vote. And then from them, 36% of it, which were women, actually you know, voted in this election. So, um, thank, Mom, Mom Bajan, so thank you. That, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yes. That really uh, is a very useful uh, you know, set of observations from you. Uh, I'm just going to ask you a very quick question. Uh, the turnout, as you said, was about 36% uh, on the female side uh, for the elections. Um, if elections go into a second round, uh, do you anticipate uh, a high turnout again and uh, a high female turnout? Uh, what, um, what might impact that? And, and can you tell us very briefly on the uh, impact of security and the work that was done by the Afghan security forces that allowed space for people to participate. Right. Uh, you know, um, uh, the the whole uh, the whole uh, problem or the question of security. To tell you the, the honest truth, uh, uh, um, Mr. it was not. It was not the main concern of the Af it was the main concern of the Afghan people, no doubt. But it was not the main deterrent anymore. Because we re realized all of us that this is something that, that the you know, in Afghanistan, whether it's right or wrong or whatever it is, we are we are living with it. And also the fact that at this point with the way our our police and our and our army, the Afghan army 
is really doing their job and, and protecting, uh, you know, Afghanistan and the Afghan people, uh, we really are feeling uh, a lot more uh, confident. And, and, and that's why uh, this whole question did not come up the way everybody was thinking that it might. Um, and, the, and, the, and the thing is that um, um, also, you know, this, this, uh, for, the, for, the, for the election uh, the, or the second term, uh, now it's uh, in my mind, you know, the way I look at the whole thing and the way I've done some studies and the way I'm kind of, uh, you know, uh, weighing the whole situation, um, it could be either a very, a very, very big turnout of people or not and usually in the in the uh, the nature of of this thing you know when an election goes on the second uh, you know time uh, or the second round um sometimes the uh, the people or the enthusiasm or whatever you want to call it might not be there but unless there is a there becomes another reason that they really really would like to decide between the two main candidates that they want one over the other depending on on what they want afghanistan or how they want afghanistan to go forward because the ways of the two gentlemen at the top uh, as far as taking afghanistan to the next steps are very different. So if that plays a huge role, then people might turn up to in big numbers, men and women, to go and vote. But if that doesn't, um, then, then you know, um, they might not. So to tell you the honest truth, I cannot give you uh, an answer in one way or yeah, another whether it's question. going to be, you know, a lot more or not really. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to I ask one or two people in the audience uh, to take advantage of this occasion. And if you have any questions for Mobu Basaraj, uh, this is the time. Yes, the lady right there. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Charlotte Beck from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, thank you very much for these remarks that were very uplifting, I think. Um, so that's good to hear. I have a question regarding the provincial elections because you focused on the presidential elections now. So could you say a little bit about the outcome of the provincial elections and how the women that were um, running for pr the provincial councils fared, um, whether there is already some, some preliminary results, etc. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that is, uh, the provincial um, council election in Afghanistan was uh, extremely, a very, how shall I say, a very important topic for the women of Afghanistan because Unfortunately, um, when we when we uh, kind of uh, lost, uh, how how shall I say, when there were votes given against um, um, uh, the EVO law, which is the elimination of all kinds of all sorts of violence against women in Afghanistan, um, and at that time uh, it was kind of uh, the Parliament of Afghanistan, you know, um, did a few things like you know voted against that one, even though it was a decree by the president, and we wanted to just um, make it as a law, but the parliament did not uh, allow it, so we shelved it, and it's going to go back into the parliament, hopefully, in the next few months, and then hopefully this time it will, it will pass. At the same time, what happened was that another situation took place, which was that the the parliament, for some strange reason, uh, because I guess they could at that time, they uh, they they took the they brought the number of women um, in the in the in the provincial uh, uh, council chairs from 25 percent to 20 percent. So that was really a kind of a, a how shall I say? It was a loss for all of us. But then at the same time, um, the 20% of women that were there, they again very bravely, you know, got into the, uh, you know, these provinces according to the numbers that were allotted to them in each one of the provinces that they could, instead of some provinces, instead of, you know, uh, two women, now there is one, but that one woman did come up uh, and they, they did run. So we are going to be, you know, hopefully getting the results uh, very soon and, uh, and then, and then we'll see, you know, oh, what is happening. I, I, I am not, I cannot tell you at this point whether there's going to be a lot more uh, you know, winners, women winners, or 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 male or female winners because the truth has been so involved 
would would listening to the to the presidential elections results that you know I haven't paid that much attention on those, but I will be paying attention to the thank you to so the much. Final uh, results of thank you so much. Any other questions for Mabuba Saraj? Last one. Yes, sir. Could you speak a little to the two remaining candidates and what their positions may be that are important to women, how to contrast them? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. What was uh, it? The, can you contrast uh, the policies and the, the, the agendas of the two candidates vis-a-vis -vis women? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. As far as the um, policies of the candidate vis-a-vis -vis women, uh, I should, you know, um, and, and this because of, the, of, of, of where we are, you know, maybe um, I cannot be talking uh, about it very, very openly, but then maybe I should at this point, uh, because, uh, because now there's only two of them left, you know, towards the end. Um, Dr. Ashraf Rani actually has uh, the, the best and the most, um, you know, really policies that involves women uh, in every every factor in every area of the of the Afghanistan government. Uh, so I mean that for him, he is and and amongst all of the candidates, he is the one that has you know has has uh, uh, how shall I say uh, is, is the one with the most um, ideas and with the most commitment and with the most plan. Uh, than any other candidate. So right now, because he happens to be amongst the uh, the two first, well, you know, that's another factor, uh, and it is so. Um, however, I, uh, you know, I really uh, don't know uh, how much um, the vote of the women are going to go towards him or not. Um, that is something that needs to be seen. Uh, a part of the votes of the women did go to him, I should say, definitely, when it came to the big city and, and places where, uh, where everybody knew most about all of his plans. And, and uh, so they, you know, there, was, there was a lot more vote uh, from women. But then in the areas, like as I mentioned, uh, because of the fact that he got a bigger part of his votes from the from the Pashtun parts of of the of the country, and in that area, the concentrations of the voters were not as much, and for that matter, the concentration of the women voters were also less. So, but at the same time, he's the one that has uh, the most agenda, you know, the better agenda for women in Afghanistan. I'm going to take one last question. The yeah, it's uh, on its way. There you go. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to you, Mohjan. This is Ali Siraj calling, talking to you from Washington. Hello, <laughs> How are you? Listen, I have a very important question. Oh, uh, considering uh, Dr. Ghani's choice of uh, General Dostum as his first vice president and General Dostum's history with the women of Afghanistan, do you think that's going to have any adverse effect on women voting for Ashraf Ghani? Um, I don't know about, you know, the second time, to tell you the honest truth, because as I said, you know, uh, some, some situations that change the, the face of the whole um, election is, is kind of, you know, changed a bit, no doubt, and it usually it does. But, um, but at first, um, from the people that actually I know, and we were in a group that uh, we were very much uh, wanting, uh, or a whole lot of women, but they really were wanting to vote for Dr. Ashraf Ghani. After his decision uh, with, um, with having uh, General Seb Dostum uh, as his first you know, running mate, um, that kind of uh, um, changed the, the mind of, 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 of women. I'm not saying that a whole lot of women, but I do say some. So percentage-wise, I cannot tell you, but I know there was there was an effect, yeah, because of that, definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, Mabua Saraj, we want to thank you so much. Uh, we hope you enjoy your few days of training in Jalalabad. Uh, and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, and uh, take care of yourself. And we will return now thank back you. to Washington from Jalalabad. Now, uh, this description and I'm going to turn to the three of you and uh, is going to help us with the discussion 
On my left, I have an old acquaintance and friend that I did not have not met since 2001. Uh, Belkis Ahmadi uh, has been an advocate, not only in an activist, not only in terms of women's rights, but in many other areas, most recently in development and through USAID. Uh, she was telling me that she has been working uh, on uh, the re reconstruction, if you would, of uh, Afghanistan's uh, subnational governance uh, and mostly concentrated on the mayor's offices around, around the country. Um, she has a long history, you will see in her bio, of uh, activities regarding Afghanistan and uh, we're happy to have you here with us today. Uh, next to Belkis is also an old friend, David Sidney, uh, who has uh, served uh, both at the State Department and also uh, in the Pentagon, uh, very recently as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia, a uh, very large, important region. Uh, prior to that, he has also served in Kabul uh, and has a long uh, and distinguished career in the U.S. State Department. Uh, David uh, is hopefully going to tell us a bit about uh, how the future of security and even sec security assistance to Afghanistan might help gender development in the country and democratization. And next to David, we have Zora Rosekh. Uh, Zora, uh, I have known only for a few minutes, <laughs> actually many years. Uh, she uh, has been an advocate for Afghanistan since the 1980s. Uh, she uh, has recently worked, and she was a member an elected member of CEDA, uh, worked for the United Nations. Uh, she was uh, at the foreign ministry in Afghanistan in charge of the uh, women's department uh, and done uh, a lot of work on Afghanistan. And prior to that, many years, uh, I, uh, an advocate when the Afghan women's cause was really not recognized. And she, uh, I remember in the late 1990s, she went underground to Afghanistan under the Taliban uh, to do a, a research and a study of the health condition of women and children in Afghanistan under the Taliban. She has some uh, harrowing stories to tell you from that experience, but her um, research was very valuable at a time when nobody really knew what was happening. So happy to have all three of you here. You. Let's turn to Belkis and ask you, how do you react to what Mobuba has said uh, for someone who has been dealing with different facets of Afghan development. Uh, and we each have about 10 to 12 minutes before we turn to the <coughs> audience and have an exchange with them. Okay, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm glad that uh, Mahbubah Saraj uh, basically articulated what did happen in Afghanistan. Uh, as Mahbubah John said, the turnout was remarkable, both men and women enthusiastically exercised their right to vote. Um, we saw an improved electoral preparation by IEC this time, by the Independent Election Commission. Afghan security forces, ANA, ANP, and NDS um, did a very good job in securing the polling stations. Uh, this time around, I think the public were more aware of their political rights. Um, although the final um, result of the election is pending adjudication of all the complaints by the electoral, by the complaint commission, uh, we do see that Dr. Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani are the front runners at this point. Uh, so these are all the positive things, despite the bad weather, despite the security concerns, the Taliban did everything they could the months and weeks and days before the election to scare off people. Um, we also recognize that there were underage voting, uh, proxy voting, ballot stuffing, intimidation by the Taliban and also by other powerful individuals and groups. Uh, we know that more than 400 polling stations had to be closed on the polling day. Um, but let's focus on lessons learned. Uh, I think this election was a success, not only for Afghan people, but also for the international community. 
after all the efforts and money being spent on building the capacity of local institutions, IEC, Independent uh, Election Commission, Independent uh, Electoral Complaint Commission, local NGOs, civil society groups, also the security forces. Now it paid off. We did see that Afghans um, took responsibility. We also recognized that uh, international experts were involved, but not to the extent they were involved in 2004 and 2005 and later on. Um, we also noticed that even the most conservative candidates and groups understood the importance of women's rights and human rights for the people of Afghanistan and also for the international community. Someone lo like Sayyaf, for example, he pledged to improve women's rights, although he had some conditions, but let's not focus on those conditions. <laughs> the fact that he said that he believed in women's rights and human rights was a very positive step. Uh, we also learned that people uh, were not intimidated by some powerful individuals that both the Afghan government and the international community had perceived them as very intimidating. I don't have to give names, but we do see that uh, individuals or candidates who belong to powerful Mujahideen groups did not win uh, enough votes to be even considered to be on the fourth, the third or fourth runner. Not that important. So let's put it that way. Um, this time around, we did see that women's rights and civil society groups were more engaged with the candidates. They were more organized. Some uh, more than 200 local organizations and NGOs got together in the months leading up to the elections. They got together. They um, put down their demands from the candidates. And they went from candidate to candidate, met with them, and said, do you agree with all of our demands, which were the basic demands, security, education, health, economic development, and political participation. I do know that some of the candidates did sign on on that piece of document that's referred to as Women's Charter, or Manchur is Anon. So those are the. Um, important lessons learned that we saw in this past election. There will be, definitely, as it looks now, a runoff, mm -hmm. which will most probably take place uh, in the first week of June, or sometime around uh, June 7 to 10 or something. Um, I think IEC, or the election, com uh, election Commission, is logistically prepared for the second round. Candidates are negotiating to rally supporters of the defeated candidates. It will be interesting to see what happens. But um, let me present to you two possible scenarios from my point of view. Um, I think that the jihadis may rally behind Dr. Abdullah because they find their views more um, closer to Dr. Abdullah's than Ashraf Ghani, because Dr. Abdullah was also involved in the jihad and so on. So that's one scenario. The other scenario is that the Pashtuns, who now see a Pashtun against a Tajik, will most probably rally behind Ashraf Ghani. We'll see if that happens. What happens, what does it mean in terms of foreign policy and relationship with the neighboring countries? Um, I think Dr. Abdullah is um, closer to Iran and Russia, uh, which Pakistan may not like. I also think that Pakistan does not want to see a strong Pashtun as the president of the country. So they may increase their intervention in Afghanistan politics. Um, but uh, I will leave that to um, 
to see in two months' time and see what happens. Uh, there are some challenges for the next administration, as we all can foresee. Uh, that includes uh, including representatives from the losing candidates in their team, um, dealing with nepotism and corruption and so on that we are all familiar with, and also to materialize the promises that they made during the campaign. We all know that sometimes politicians make promises. Uh, but this time around, we have a very um, awaken civil society groups. They are going to demand action from the uh, next president administration. Economy is very important, the top priority on everyone's agenda. We'll see how the next candidate or administration create jobs mm -hmm. for the young that Mahuva Saraj was referring to, rightfully. Um, and also policy towards uh, neighboring countries. Thank you very much. David, uh, having served within the US government until recently, um, if you were still at the Pentagon, let's say, and you looked into the future, and in reference to what Mabu Basaraj said, that people are really focused on the future and mainly on protecting the gains, what advice would you give in terms of what steps need to be taken to protect those gains? and in regards to gender policy within the overall security uh, mindset that exists. OK, thank you. And uh, thank you, Omar. So thank my panelists. Thank the New America Foundation uh, for uh, holding, uh, holding this event and keeping people's focus on the issue of uh, the importance of uh, women in Afghanistan, uh, both for Afghanistan and uh, for the United States, which has uh, invested so much in Afghanistan. Uh, before turning to answer your question, I just wanted to mention that uh, right before I came here, I got an email from my friend, Dr. Seema Samar, who was expressing regret that she'd been here, uh, echoed the points about the election uh, others had made, but also asked to make the point that, uh, that two points, uh, the importance of education as a fundamental uh, priority for achieving the goals uh, uh, of women in Afghanistan. If, if women don't know their rights, uh, then they can't uh, f fight for them. She's, she wanted me to stress F education, so I did that. And secondly, she stressed for the importance of the commitment uh, of the United States and others, and, and I will talk a little bit more about that in specific uh, response uh, to your question, Omar. The importance of that continuing commitment after 2014. I'd like to say a couple words about the election itself, particularly from the issue of women and security. Uh, the turnout of uh, women, uh, as Omar said, uh, was quite impressive, uh, both given uh, the uh, uh, emphasis of the Taliban on both preventing the elections and the opposition of the Taliban to the participation of women in the elections. It was also impressive because of the large societal constraints that continue to hamper women's efforts, a uh, woman's uh, ability to play a full role in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the uh, th specific issues on security was that in order for polling stations to operate and to have women come and vote, you needed to have uh, female election security personnel there in order to ensure that the person who came, and in, uh, in most places in Afghanistan, the person who comes uh, as a woman wears uh, this blue, uh, blue uh, uh, fabric called a burqa. Um, uh, the problem, however, is uh, for some reason the Taliban, uh, while they're, they're opposed to women's rights, they love to dress up in these uh, blue burqas. The Taliban love to dress up like women and uh, come in and use that as a cover to kill people. Uh, so you have to have uh, security people who can ensure that the, per the individual who's in a woman's burqa is really a woman or not and that person has to be a woman. Uh, so getting sufficient women sec election security personnel and getting them trained was a big challenge. Uh, the, uh, it was a, a major effort was made to do that, uh, but it wasn't, I would say, fully successful. There were not, in the end, as many trained election security workers as necessary, and there specifically weren't as enough elec trained election, woman election security uh, personnel in some of the more dangerous and some of the more conservative areas. And so that's one of the things people say, well, why didn't 50% of the women turned out? Uh, uh, well, uh, there are a lot of reasons, but one of them is that in some places there just wasn't a security. 
uh, that was necessary. And that goes to uh, the next issue I want to, to mention, uh, security overall. Uh, the, election, the Afghan security forces uh, during the period up to and during the election did perform, uh, I think, magnificently. Uh, our, uh, our military on the ground, NATO military on the ground has said that as well. Uh, and they faced a huge problem because the efforts of the Taliban in the two months before the election, not just on election day, but in the two months before the election, to uh, get fighters, weapons, and explosives across the border from Pakistan and deploy them and kill people, attack the election headquarters, attack the Serena Hotel, attack provincial election officials, attempt to assassinate uh, some of the candidates. All of that was happening, and the Afghan security forces did a tremendous job of stopping 95 or so percent of those attacks. Their success ratio was very high. Unfortunately, when you are in that business, if your success ratio is less than 100 percent, people die, and that did happen. And there were scores of people who were killed and wounded on election day in the time up to that. Um, in terms of women's security, one thing that continues to be very important is having women in the security forces themselves, women in the army, women in the police, women in the intelligence services. Uh, what we have found here in the United States, uh, those of you who follow issues relating to the U.S. military know that this continues to be an issue in the U.S. military. Uh, it's important in order to have fair treatment for women, you have to have women in the security services themselves. It's very difficult right now for women to join the Afghan army, the Afghan police, the Afghan intelligence services. Uh, because of societal constraints, I've talked to many women who have joined the Afghan security forces and many women who have not. Uh, and the, the number one issue they face is societal constraints. Uh, uh, parents, uncles, brothers. Uh, I've talked to women who said they were uh, threatened with death by their brother if they joined the army. Uh, so these societal constraints still exist and they're very strong. Uh, but fortunately, many women are joining uh, the Afghan security forces. Uh, yesterday, the Department of Defense released its uh, report on progress on security in Afghanistan, uh, the so-called 1230 report, uh, which is the one official document the U.S. produces, U.S. government produces every six months. And it uh, had in it uh, the latest report on the numbers of women in the Afghan army and Afghan uh, police and the Afghan Air Force. And there's slow uh, but steady improvement in the numbers. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I want to, as, as we look ahead, say that it's very important to continue that progress. Uh, the U.S. Congress has recognized the importance of that. And in the most recent uh, National Defense Authorization Act, earmarked $25 million in spending for, from the Afghan security forces to, to support recruitment, training, retention of women in the Afghan security forces. And that's an important, uh, that's, th that legislation uh, and that, that commitment of money is important. But that commitment of money and uh, the ability of the Afghan woman to carry out, uh, to, to continue to act in security and the ability of women to act is all dependent upon a continuing military presence by the U.S. and NATO. The Afghan security forces did an incredible job. Uh, but they are not yet ready to stand fully on their own. The Afghan Ministry of Defense, uh, the Afghan uh, Ministry of Interior, uh, areas such as logistics, intelligence, uh, air support. Uh, without those, the Afghan security forces, uh, no matter how brave they are, are not going to be able to continue su to succeed. Uh, so I uh, will stay here very confidently uh, that, we, that we in the United States, you asked what the United States can do for security of women, and this is the security of women is linked to the security of everyone else. Uh, we have to have a serious, substantial commitment of U.S. and NATO forces, uh, 10,000 to 20,000 uh, security forces, to provide that assistance to the Afghan security forces. Uh, I, um, as I said, I uh, believe that the congressional uh, commitment to $25 million was important, but in the end it's useless if there aren't uh, U.S. Uh, and other NATO forces there to ensure that the money is spent well and to ensure that the women uh, uh, continue to, to progress in the Afghan security forces. Uh, our experience around the world is that if you don't have a uh, woman, as I said, in the security forces, the security forces are, are not conducive uh, to working with women, and that if you don't have uh, uh, on the ground support for that, it won't happen. 
uh, empty lectures uh, are useless. In my job uh, as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan and Pakistan, I had to testify. And I often testified before some very well-meaning members of Congress who would say, we want to continue to support the women of Afghanistan, but we, want, but we also want American troops out. And I would tell them, that's not possible. Uh, if US troops leave and the Afghan security forces are uh, very well armed because they're well armed, uh, they're trained to kill, uh, they actually are pretty good at fighting, but without the continuing support uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of US and NATO forces, um, they will end up becoming an abusive instrument of power as have so many other militaries. So you asked what I would advise. I would advise that the United States today make a commitment after 2014 to have that, uh, to, to have uh, 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 10,000 US forces and around 6,000 NATO forces in Afghanistan afterwards. One of the things that makes the continuing infiltration of the Taliban across the border possible is because the Taliban themselves are not sure about the future. Uh, they continue to believe they may be able to win militarily. They continue to hear uh, talk of such things as a zero option in the United States or from other NATO, from NATO countries that they are going to pull out. And as long as that's a possibility, they will continue to come across the border and fight and kill. If they, were, if they had certainty that Afghanistan, whichever presidential candidate, and I'll leave that to, uh, yes. to, to others to discuss, <laughs> whichever presidential candidate, both of whom said they would sign the BSA, uh, whichever candidate wins, uh, if they also had the surety that whoever it is, uh, that, is that's, that candidate is going to have the continuing, uh, not just financial, but also military and security support from the rest of the world, then this threat from the Taliban would go down, mm -hmm. uh, and then less people would die. Uh, so by making an announcement today of a continued commitment to Afghanistan, not waiting for the BSA to be signed, because it's clear it will be signed, uh, that's what this administration could do right now to make Afghanistan safer, to make the next round of elections uh, safer, and to, uh, and to uh, save actual lives. One comment on the issue of second round turnout. If you look around the world at similar situations where there are local and national elections that take place at the same time and then later on a runoff, turnout in the second round is always lower. lower. Uh, so uh, for people, uh, journalists and others who are setting expectations, I would say if turnout in the second round is more than 40%, uh, that will be very impressive. I think 40% is, uh, getting 40% turnout for the second round is going to be a challenge. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, I've had a chance to travel in Afghanistan a few months ago and uh, have heard from many people, the enthusiasm that was generated by some of the provincial, district, provincial council elections in some areas was very important to that turnout. The turnout was not just about the presidential elections. In fact, in some cases, it was, it was some areas it was more about provincial council elections than presidential elections. So that factor won't be there, and that also was likely for it to a lower turnout. Finally, uh, the, uh, I think the Afghan security forces uh, could well face a stronger challenge uh, than they did last time, and uh, they will need even more support if, if they do so. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those Thanks, are my David. comments. Thank you. Nonetheless, uh, Afghans are also known to uh, defy uh, expectations and uh, so and overcome them. So there's a possibility that you may have a higher turnout in the second round. Let's see. Zora, uh, let's uh, take a step back and look at this election, the women's role, the participation, the inclusivity, the breaking of barriers, as Mobuba mentioned, of ethnic barriers and gender barriers and generational barriers and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. If you look at all of this and you're sitting in s at CEDAW, let's say, and you have to deal with very difficult problems that exist in certain societies, mm -hmm. uh, such as violence. Um, how would you look at, how would you see Afghanistan? And what would you, how would you uh, also give us a, a blueprint for the way forward? Um, thank you, Marjan. And uh, I would like to thank the New American uh, Foundation and the Women for Women Afghanistan. Um, this is a very good question. It's exactly what I wanted to talk about. Um, let me this is not rehearsed, by the way. Yeah. No. <laughs> OK. Um, by the way, uh, I just came from Afghanistan a few weeks ago and uh, got a call from Omar John yesterday mm -hmm. about this event. So I, I was glad to come and um, talk about my own assessment when I was in Kabul. And I did speak with some women 
uh, just uh, for myself to see how women and also men um, think about uh, elections and, and what, whether or not they are ready to uh, vote. Uh, but <clears throat> before that, let me say that through my lens, I see this election as a breakthrough. And I'm very optimistic. Having said that, I also have to say that I am very, I, I would be very cautious and look at this uh, election and the outcome of the election and the outcome for women with a lot of caution. Having um, been working for the CEDA committee, which is the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women at the United Nations, um, for four years I have been um, reviewing and uh, uh, communicating with uh, governments regarding their accomplishments on women's uh, issues from all rights, from political participation to education and, and health and uh, everything. So uh, that tells me that governments make promises, especially during elections. And in Afghanistan, this is new. Uh, the fact that uh, all three uh, co candidates, the, the three ones that were um, uh, the winners, included women. Now, some of them, I think, were very genuine. I think both Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Uh, Ashraf Ghani has genuine interest in women's uh, rights improvements. I worked with Dr. Abdullah personally as his advisor on women and human rights and as the head of his, um, the director of the Office of uh, Human Rights and Women's Affairs. Uh, he was the one who invited me to come and start such an office. So. Regardless of my pains, when I say pains, I really mean pains, uh, in that situation, he was very supportive. So I would look forward uh, to um, Dr. Abdullah as the president because I have seen personally that he is interested. Well, people around him were, were not that much supportive of women's rights, but he personally supported me. So I am... Um, confident that uh, Dr. Abdullah as the candidate will do and will um, stay behind his words about improvement of women's rights. Same thing with Dr. Ashraf Ghani. He, as a technocrat and as someone who has two um, uh, uh, runmates, both of whom I know, and I think both of them has, have no problem with women issues, regardless of um, whether uh, you know, the, the history of um, Mr. Dostom and so on. But I think in both candidates, during both of their times, there will be support of women's rights. But when I said we have to look at this with caution, it's because uh, history has shown, uh, as showed, and also other countries in post-conflict situation, when countries who are uh, in, um, in the situation similar to Afghanistan, such as Iraq, such as uh, uh, Egypt, um, if we review their accomplishment and the accomplishments of women after the elections, they still are struggling. There are not much uh, happening. So it is not for, if we, the first question is, what's the stance of, in your, in the uh, theme of today's um, discussion, is uh, the stance of the candidates. I think there is, um, in addition to using women as a demographic to, to get their votes, which is good. I think it's better to keep him aside to bring him in. Um, they have publicly made commitment, all the three candidates. And that, they have to have the political will. So the political will is there. It's for women advocates. I'm not saying women alone, women advocates. That include men as well, Afghan men and the international community to push. So what I call the four Ps, the political will, which there is some, but needs to be pushed for more, uh, and taking out of the, the, the government and the new um, administration. The um, second P is the um, promotion um, that the civil society, the international organizations, the women groups, all of us need to, to bring out. My personal experience, again, when I worked with Dr. Abdullah, it wasn't easy, but I made every single issues that was important under my division, under my mandate, happen. I went to his office, 
I explained to him, I convinced him, and he never said no. So if we have a plan, a policy, and um, a commitment, it can happen, regardless of who wins. Um, the, the, the other uh, issue is policy change. There's a lot of um, discriminatory laws in place right now. Uh, the EVAL, the um, Elimination of Violence Against Women law, was about to be um, denounced uh, by some of the uh, folks that are also a candidate for the mm -hmm. presidency. Now, that sort of things needs to be a lot of laws, regardless of some changes that has happened in the last 12 years, there are many laws in Afghanistan that are highly discriminatory towards women. So those needs to be, uh, of course, change of policy. Um, and um, the, uh, this was the, my third P. The fourth P is pushing. So pushing of the international community, which brings the, the, the issue of the role of the international community. The international community has done a lot, and thanks to the help and the pushing and support of the international community that Afghan women are, have got where they are now. Without them, very little would have happened during Mr. Karzai's administration. Discrimination against women happened by men in suits and ties. And by the way, I'm writing, writing a book during a, for my experience at that time by these men in suits. Most of them came from the West. That is existing. So what, what needs to be done is the international community continues to push and, and needs to, con and needs to um, fund, and fund the right place. We have a lot of funding going to Afghanistan and women causes, but unfortunately, it disappears and women's situation is still the same. Women don't have running water and clean water in villages and, uh, and, and rural areas. Women have no access to health, education. Um, and, and economic uh, empowerment of women, jobs. I don't think it is, the, this election, a lot of people are excited because women are going to be leaders and, and uh, working with the government and become elites in, in, the, in the public and, and private sectors. That is not what the Afghan women need. I think the candidates need to take a good look at the real women in Afghanistan. I'm not a, a, a normal women who lives uh, in Afghanistan and is, is, is in need of uh, civil, political, economic, social, cultural rights, which are all not looked at. So the donors and in the international community needs to also review their policies and their programs that they have undertaken in the last 12 years. If they really want women to be empowered, empowerment of women is not training leaders. We have a lot of leader, leaders in Afghanistan, female leaders. Women know what to do because when they run a family without food, without a male um, uh, breadwinner, and, and being their own uh, leader at home, they can be a leader in public and in society. They need empowerment of their economic situation. They need education. They need security and they need health. We need healthy women in order to uh, really have women stand up and become their own advocates. But most importantly, this is what I always talk about or, or, or tell governments when I'm sitting in my seat in CEDA committee. Men, uh, we have forgotten the role of men in Afghanistan. Unless the road is paved for women, to get out there and vote, regardless of security. There could be perfect security and there could be perfect um, political will for women. If men in their, uh, uh, in their homes, if fathers, brothers, husbands, sons, whomever, men in the community, religious leaders, will not allow them to go out to work or to vote or to um, whatever that they have to do in their public life, it's not going to happen. So what I advise, especially major donors who have big pro projects in Afghanistan, and I'm, I think some of you know who I'm talking about, is to first train, educate, and raise awareness among Afghan men. The societies that have strong women movement and women in public and private 
sector working and active is because their men m wanted, want them to be out there. And we need more men advocates, more men to support women, to protect women, and to stay behind them. And uh, that is, I think, uh, what uh, is needed, whether it's Dr. Abdullah or Dr. Ashraf Ghani, uh, to get women in the next 10 years. Let's not be too excited and, 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 and expect that next year or next six months, women will be all out there and, and prosperous. It takes time, but I, again, would push the candidates, both of whom have political will. And men and women, just, I shouldn't say just men, uh, who are around these candidates also need to be trained and sensitized to the need of women mm -hmm. because the next election, they will look for the same women as a demographic to vote. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Th th thank you, Zora. Uh, very useful um, and thought-provoking, and I hope that our audience now is fully awake uh, after the coffee, after the Jalalabad talk, and after the Washington talk. So uh, since we have about 15 minutes or so left, I'm going to go straight uh, to, to you. Uh, and please identify yourself uh, and uh, ask a short <coughs> question. Uh, I know everybody has probably a lot to say, but uh, let's uh, keep it a bit short. In the back, right there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for your presentation, for everything that you've taught us this morning. My name is Chris uh, Bassett from the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. And I'm interested to know, based on the lessons learned, building on the progress made to date, what practical steps can we do to improve women's participation as candidates, as advocates, and as, uh, as voters in the 2015 parliamentary elections? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's take one more. And then, yes. Uh, Anjuman Apte from Voice of America, Afghanistan Service. Uh, my question is to, um, for, for both the uh, ladies, uh, speakers, actually. It's about uh, your expectations uh, from the next government about involving women in the peace process. How would you foresee the next Afghan government to involve women in the peace process? Okay, thank you. Should we go to both questions to both, unless David has something to say, well, please? Sure. I'll start with the second question first. Expectations from the new administration about women's participation in the peace process. Um, in Afghan culture, women play a very important role in basically resolving uh, crisis and conflicts between families, not at the national level so far. So women can play a major role, and Afghan, the new administration must understand the importance of women's role, especially in Pashtun Wali. They have mm. these uh, women. When a woman go to the rivalry's house or village and ask for forgiveness for something that a male family member has done in their village or in their family, then it has to be granted. That's the way things are. Women do play a very important role. Unfortunately, so far it has been symbolic. I don't think they have played a very active role. Uh, but the fact that they are there, that shows that women's participation is important. It's a, it's a message to Afghan government as well to the oppositions and whoever is involved in the peace process or peace talks. Um, the next government must understand women's important role, not only in um, education and health, that's always talked about, but also in political affairs, social affairs, and cultural affairs. Uh, what was the second question? Uh, the first the, the question? About parliamentary elections next Parliamentary year. election is as important as presidential election. Most of the laws that we see that are passed or not passed is because of the parliament in Afghanistan. Uh, Zora John was referring to the evil law. The evil law is a law by decree. The parliament refused to sign on that uh, law. So 
while a lot of focus has been placed on the presidential election, I think parliamentary election is as important as presidential election. Uh, training women, public awareness about women's rights, about human rights and the needs of Afghan people as a nation, not as an ethnic group. That has to be done. Media plays a very important role, civil society, international community. Thanks for their support. Have done a lot of work in raising awareness so far on political participation of people. I think it has to be continued. Not only that, but one thing that I forgot to mention is the role of the human rights defenders and women's rights defenders. They risk their lives to protect the basic rights of other men and women in the country. That's a topic that uh, has not been talked about a lot, but human rights defenders are facing a huge problem in Afghanistan. Groups such as Women for Afghan Women, people who work for this organization, put their lives at risk to protect men, uh, women and children that needs to be supported. International, when the international community kind of sort of dropped the ball between 2004 and 2000 and now, <laughs> I think the Afghan government <coughs> dropped it completely. Very important that international community keeps pushing for improving women's rights situation in Afghanistan. David mentioned women's role in the security forces. Everyone understands in Afghanistan that men cannot search women. It's a cultural taboo. But at the same time, they don't want their girls and their sisters to go and join security forces. The next government can uh, do a lot by educating the public about the benefits of having women in security forces for their own benefit and for the safety of their families and their children. Thank you. Zora, would you like to quickly answer those two questions? Um, yeah, for the uh, question of the gentleman about uh, the practical uh, steps for the election in 2015 for par female parliamentarian, um, I, my experience with the parliamentarians in general is that they need to know their role Unfortunately, um, many times uh, members of parliament go to minister's office to uh, advocate for causes that benefits somebody or something that is related to them personally. And of course, they do work on the law, but it, it has been a, a habit. And it really is um, part of the corrupt system in the Afghan government. Uh, and I would say education and awareness of the female candidates about the role of parliamentarians for the future of the government, their role in improving women's uh, rights and women's situation in Afghanistan. Uh, because uh, there are parliamentarian, female parliamentarians that are not really supportive of women's rights. I've worked with them. There are a number of them who are supporting, but there are a number who are uh, backed by some warlord or someone who push their cause towards these females. So it's very important that they, they are elected quickly and also they, they learn what to do, what's their job. And uh, another issue is, of course, uh, they're uh, providing protection for them so they can, uh, when they go to uh, lobby, they have enough support and protection. That's what I can think right now. On the now. peace front? And on the uh, peace uh, involvement. Afghanistan has uh, signed uh, what is called the Security Council 1325, which is uh, a, a commitment to make sure women are involved and in peace talks, in uh, reconstruction, negotiation, and so on. But uh, like many other countries, even developing countries, Afghanistan has not really uh, implemented this in practice. So. Uh, what needs to be done, uh, women who are capable, who are competent and strong, needs to be in the place of leadership in the government. We had a Ministry of Women's Affairs, and unfortunately, very weak ministry. We need strong women, whether it's the Ministry of Women's Affairs, whether it's the Foreign Ministry, whether it's the Justice Ministry. These women need to be in, involved in the peace talks. We don't, in Afghanistan, do not need symbols. Women have symbolically have sat there. 
once somebody told me in the London um, meeting, it was the two you years ago. Conference. A conference. Mm -hmm. It was uh, well, there were women uh, NGOs participating. That's not what we need. We need women to actually talk about not women's issues because this is another problem. Women come to talk about women's issues. Women who talk about security, peace, and Politics. economy and the rest of the things. So mm -hmm. the solution is that the, the next government, next president, assign capable women. Women in Afghanistan should stand up, not just women, but men also. And the parliament should not approve. If a woman is backed up by a warlord or somebody whose father is um, brought votes for uh, the candidates, there has to be the strong women who really can bring the issues in the peace talk. They should be in the discussions. And not just one woman. There should be more women. So the expectation of myself as a woman from the government is to um, abide what is uh, their commitment to the international uh, laws, such as CEDAW, such as uh, the um, Security Council 1325, and many others, and also uh, make sure that women have a voice in security. Great. Thank you. Uh, David, really quick. Really uh, quick, uh, practical things to improve women's participation in the parliamentary election. Getting uh, started earlier on the recruitment and training of the female security workers that we mentioned before. Since this time, uh, it was started too late and not done effectively. Because if, and then uh, parallel, letting, uh, having a campaign, a publicity campaign about that. Because if both men and women know that there is, good, there is better security at the polling places, then women are more likely to vote. So that would be one suggestion. A second suggestion uh, would be a higher level leadership commitment to this issue. Uh, both in the uh, army and in the police, uh, there was, I say, mixed record of support for this. Uh, so, a, if ministers uh, and uh, deputy ministers were to get out and support uh, 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 the security effort for women, I think that would send a message to Afghan men and others that th they take security seriously, and then women are more likely to be able to vote. Mm -hmm. And then, thirdly, this is totally off the gender topic. Uh, but one thing that's been missing from the Afghan elections scene since the Constitution was passed was the uh, m requirement in the Constitution that district councils be elected. Uh, that has not been done because of claims that the security didn't exist. Uh, actually, the performance of the Afghan security forces this time has shown that's not true. I believe that if you had district councils coupled with, the pr with parliamentary elections, you would have a much higher turnout overall, including greater women. Not only that, but uh, you could also then legally call upon a lawyer jirga if there's a need. Which the government could do so because, because its stipulation is that the district level candidate, uh, uh, right. representatives have to be present. And also, in regards to uh, the provincial council, uh, another reason, assuming that uh, this is correct, why there are, there are more women participating this time around, and also a lot of youth, is that it is also a springboard, a political springboard for many. And there is also the opportunity to go and become a senator because part of the Senate comes from the Provincial Council membership. So this is another way, segue to uh, uh, advancing politically in Afghanistan. Uh, let, let's take the last three questions quickly. One, two, three. And I hope other, others will have a chance to have a discussion uh, so I'm Fatma Sayed from Feminist Majority Foundation. And I would like to ask uh, Zuhra John uh, in regards to her comments that she um, uh, said about pushing the international community should push the Afghan government, especially the new one. So uh, how could uh, uh, women's rights NGOs here in the United States can get involved in this uh, pushing the Afghan government to fulfill their promises in regards to involving women's rights? Um, let's, let's take the okay. three and then we will get to them. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Siraj. Uh, this question is to you, Mr. Sidney. Uh, we've been talking about uh, security in Afghanistan and uh, 2014 coming to an end and the uh, world leaving Afghanistan. Uh, they expect the Afghan National Army to defend the nation. A National Army today, which is uh, totally devoid of having any air support of their own, uh, no no uh, heavy equipment like tanks are armored, except for a few Humvees, which have been left behind. 
majority of the, the billions of dollars that the U.S. government spent in bringing their equipment into Afghanistan, and now they're pulling it all out, not leaving very much for the Afghan military. On a mountainous region like Afghanistan, and with the terrorists coming from across the border into Afghanistan, uh, how do you expect the uh, Afghan National Army to defend the nation and defend the rights of the women, which the Taliban are trying to suppress ever since they have been in Afghanistan? Thank you. Up front, right here. Thank you. Hi, thank you. This is a question for the entire panel. Um, we, over the last 13 years, we saw very little, if nothing, of Mrs. Karzai. Um, and that was obviously for very p particular reasons. What are your expectations um, moving forward? Whomever wins, Dr. Abdullah or Dr. Shafrani, how would you foresee or wish to see or have expectations around the role of their spouse moving ahead and the link to uh, women's rights? Okay. Shall we uh, start from that side now, Z Zora? Uh, yes, uh, Fatima John, I think uh, a feminist majority in particular uh, have pushed very hard um, when the Taliban were since, uh, since you know since the, the takeover of Taliban. Um, and let me also just just add that Zora was part of the first uh, four Afghans who went to uh, feminist majority in 1997 or so to tell them that there's something bad happening in Afghanistan. And so I'm a witness to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and, and uh, recently I'm not, I have not been um, aware, at least, uh, or maybe there are some activities from feminist majority in Afghanistan, so I'm wondering uh, what's happening there. But I think what, what can be done is uh, through um, watching Organizations, international women organizations, could act as a watchdog, uh, not just to uh, towards the Afghan government, but also donors and organizations who go there to uh, implement projects to see what is happening. There's a lot of money going in the in, uh, for women projects. Uh, that needs. That's one of the areas, but. Uh, also through um, dialogues with the government, through um, uh, meetings, and making sure that women rights, uh, whether it's political participation uh, or anything else, uh, is in place. I'm sure you know they know how to do it, but uh, there's always uh, ways to make sure the right women get into the right position. And there has to be some voice. Uh, the, the noise has to always be there in order for. Uh, the governments to really take things seriously. On the next first lady? Oh, first lady, very interesting question. Uh, of course, uh, I met Mrs. Karzai only once, uh, of course, and, and she was uh, not uh, in any kind of uh, active role, uh, we all know. Uh, but that was uh, probably a different reason. For the new, the two candidates, I know Mr. Ghani's wife has given presentation and speeches, and she's not an Afghan. So that's one factor. Dr. Abdullah, I hope that his wife uh, would be included uh, in um, women empowerment uh, causes. And I think uh, now that, uh, that when I said it's a breakthrough, it's because women came out. There's a woman um, uh, vice president out there. So there are more, uh, what do you call, uh, the encouragement for women. Men don't see that as a strange thing that a woman is coming out. So I think there's encouragement, but also uh, probably uh, Dr. Abdullah, if he wins, will uh, bring his wife to be in the leadership towards women causes. But um, how much difference would it make in Afghanistan? I think it will make a lot of difference because it, it tells men that it's okay to let your wife uh, come out and work and be in the leadership position. Mm -hmm. So. Let's push for, for that. But I know one of the candidates already has done that. Mm -hmm. David, on the question to you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's an excellent question. Ms. Le Mr. Ali Sabraj, as always, you have a very sharp and perceptive mind, and you've identified some key issues. Uh, the uh, uh, Afghan army is currently uh, constructed and is currently restricted as a result of a number of decisions over the last several years has exactly the weaknesses you say, and those weaknesses need to be addressed. 
um, and uh, that is uh, a, but the ability of uh, the forces on the ground, the people in the Pentagon to do that has been absent because of the lack of a decision uh, by uh, our government, by our president, to stay in Afghanistan after 2014. As long as that was, question was still open, would we have a presence there after 2014 or not? As long as people in the administration pursued the zero option, it was impossible to do the proper planning for what happens after 2014. There has been a lot of planning done, uh, but it's not been very good planning as a result of that lack of clear political direction and clear political commitment. So that's the real reason behind uh, the problems that you so accurately identified. Uh, you, you mentioned the issue of the uh, amount of money that's spent on bringing things into and out of Afghanistan. The U.S. government has wasted somewhere between five and ten billion dollars in transportation costs in the effort to try and get all the military equipment out of Afghanistan by the end of this year. Uh, if we were Did you say wasted? Wasted between five and ten billion dollars uh, by moving things out of Afghanistan at a pace so that everything could be out by the end of this year. Because the, of the way logistics works, you have to do things two, three, four years in advance. So the U.S. military has been pulling the equipment out at a rate so that it could get everything out by the end of this year if that's what the president decided. Because of that, and we continue to waste money at that, that order by pulling equipment out more quickly. If we had a political decision to stay uh, after 2014, then our logisticians would plan to move things out at a slower pace, use cheaper land routes instead of expensive air routes, and it's about four or five times as expensive to move things by air. Uh, then that extra money, uh, that extra money, that, that, that money that is not being wasted on uh, the speedy pullout could then be used for some of the purposes you said. Again, a very perceptive question. I thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for that. Mm, thank you. Bill Keith? Uh, I agree with Zola John on the last question that yes, uh, having not only the next president's wife uh, active in uh, politics and also in women's empowerment, but also the ministers, the cabinet. We don't see many ministers, current ministers, uh, going to events or even their wives being actively involved in politics and women's empowerment will send a very strong message about the important role women can and are able to play in politics and the reconstruction of Afghanistan. Can I make yes. an American observation? Maybe, the <coughs> maybe there's an element of, of fear there. We, of course, are in a situation where a former first lady is running for president. And uh, 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 Senator, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton is running for president, uh, obviously building on her role as a first lady. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some men are uncomfortable with that. I, 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 uh, <laughs> I have been. Uh, Two lines, okay. First of all, Afghanistan women have always played a major role in the history of Afghanistan. Uh, three, three names that I can mention right off the bat. Going back uh, almost a century, yes. Going back centuries, Malalai, and the second Anglo Afghan War, the, 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 the tribes were retreating when she took off a bay when she started attacking the British. Uh, an entire British regiment was defeated because of that. And the third Queen Soraya, who was the first woman in, in the world to start the in Afghanistan, removed her veil, came upon the law, realized the, the importance of Afghan women, and brought the queen out and said to the people that the, uh, the country needed both men and women to work side by side to build the country. Mm -hmm. The British used them against him. The revolution of 1949, Afghanistan women movement was set back into history, okay, until now Constance. Then again, the, the, communist, the, the communists came over, and Afghanistan women right. were kicked back. Taliban came, this was the worst time for, for Afghan women. Afghan women are the backbone of Afghanistan, and I'm very proud to say that I'm a member of the family who lost their throne on behalf of the Afghan women. Yes. So well, good thing that you're still here with us. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so what we want to make sure is that we do not have a regression again. We want to make so sure is that we... Is, yes. So let me, let me allow... Uh, I know that time is running out. Someone has been very <laughs> effectively <laughs> trying to say something. Um, my name is Shakila Kalji, and I know three of you panelists. It's, I couldn't leave today without saying that you've been instrumental 
for the past 13 years and doing so much for Afghanistan. We came a long way. This is Shakila Zorajan. <laughs> And uh, these ladies are my, I, I call you my friends, but we haven't been in touch for a long time. And I know from Omar John from way back, the struggles you guys, everybody knows way me. back, way <laughs> back, when there were no human rights openly, there were no governments, there were nobody talked about Afghanistan, nobody cared about Afghanistan. Everything was non-existence. And you guys were working towards, and I was a little bit part of it. So. Not to go back down memory lane, I just wanted to thank you so much. We came a long way. I'm a member of an NGO in Afghanistan, so you do your bit, I do my bit. And we are terribly concerned about what's going to happen. Our donors are checking out, I should say. Um, the women's issues, you covered pretty much everything, both of you, and I'm so glad I don't want to go back through it, but at the moment, um, for the past years, I am barking at anyone and everyone in D.C. that what happened to all those women's organizations who were so fighting for women's rights in Afghanistan. The same thing, and they all disappeared. Um, Afghanistan, especially women's issues, no longer sexy uh, along with the other issues in Afghanistan. So when the lady asked about what can we do, we can do a lot. We were part of an advocacy group some 10, 15 years ago, or 13 years ago. We went to the capital, we were screaming about fundings and human rights and women's rights for that matter. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm concerned about the fundings and the role of small NGOs in Afghanistan, whether they're run by Afghans, total volunteers. There are a lot of NGOs who are working great uh, work in Afghanistan. They don't get fundings from biggies, but they survived on shoestring budgets and grassroots. Um, and uh, we would like to continue that in Afghanistan. It's so important that we are established now. So what, what anyone is doing about that is a question and a concern. And as far as um, the, the Constitution is written. I remember clearly I was a journalist back then, a radio journalist, and I asked many key people, including women in Afghan government back then in 2001, 2, 3, 4, that uh, there are a lot of things in the Constitution that is kind of um, counterintuitive counter to the human rights and women's rights. And how many times they hushed me, they intimidated me to not bring up questions that brings up you know, um, disturbs the situation. We are way behind that. We should just be very compliant about things. This is not the right time. There's never the right time to talk about women's issues and human rights issues. We have to be brave enough to talk about it. We have to challenge our governments and our people and our even civil societies and people who are in the, in the go women particularly, who told me that we shouldn't talk about these things right now. It's very dangerous. So. Um, it's very important now also for the new governments for people to be not compliant. And I deal with a lot of young Afghans in Afghanistan. There are a lot of fresh Afghan people who are interested in being part of the political dialogue in Afghanistan. But still the oldies are running the show and they would like to be part of that narratives and make a difference. So that is important too. We're going to have to have you on another panel. <laughs> we should. <laughs> and I am I'm going sorry. to ask, I'm going to ask, Laura, Thanks. to say two words, and then I'm going to ask Shafi, who represents ASAP, an organization in town, to tell us why an organization such as, such as ASAP is important to have right now, and then we're going to wrap it up, sorry. Thank you, Omar. Um, I've also known Omar for a long, long, long time, um, when I had a lot less gray hair. Hi, hey, Zohra. Hey, David. This actually is for you, um, Dazdi. Um, because it's something that I've been working on and been thinking about for a long time. Um, I'm not as optimistic at this time currently about our military and our NATO commitment to improving women's integration into the security forces. Um, I, we now have an ISAF mission that has gender advisor billets, and we have enough, but we don't have enough people actually being filled, being put into them. We even have a flag officer level at ISAF headquarters that continues to go unfilled. Um, and the thing is, we also have precious few American gender, military, or police advisors. Um, and we know that we need an American presence to actually push through that agenda, which we here in this room are so committed to see, to give and help women in Afghanistan secure themselves. Um, we have the policy. We've got 25 million, but it came in the last year of the ISAF mission, not in the first or even in the middle. So while I agree we have the ability and the know-how and even the policy, we do have the policy to do this, um, I'm worried in the post-2014 mission when we have a small, itsy-bitsy fraction of the presence that we have even today there on the ground, that we will actually dedicate 
the resources and the woman power to do what you're saying, which is to integrate women into the security forces. What can we do, though? You, you, there is something we can do. I just don't know what it is. You, you have a, a, a quick answer is, is along the lines of what I said before. Uh, the, uh, uh, the problems you identify are, are real. Uh, but uh, the, as the previous, uh, as the previous uh, speak, uh, the previous uh, audience member said, uh, what there isn't uh, here in the United States is a sustained push by American women's organizations on the security front. Uh, because, as I said, when I would go to Congress, I would get questioned by by women members of Congress, women members of Congress, who would say, "You have to make sure Afghan women are kept safe." And the next breath, they would say, "We want all all foreign troops out, all American troops out, and we don't want to spend any more money on security." And, and the answer is, you can't do that. If you want security in Afghanistan, uh, you have to spend the money and you have to have the political commitment to do so. So, what one concrete thing U.S. women's organizations could do is speak out and say that we. Uh, Earmarks are all well and good. Uh, hortatory language is all well and good. But in the end, what you need is you need people on the ground and you, you need money actually appropriated. Mm. Would, it, would it also not be helpful, though, for also for women military leadership addresses Congress to also bring that up? Because it would actually help them be able to carry out their mission to actually highlight uh, that. Our military leadership, when they address Congress, does exactly what they're told to by the White House. So. Mm. Last plug in. Plug from ASAP. Thank you very much, Safir Saab. Uh, Shafi Sharifi from Alliance in Support of the Afghan People. I just make a case on a personal level. Just uh, a lot of people tend to look at Afghanistan from the eyes of the last 12 years. But in fact, it, a lot of people forget where Afghanistan was before 2001. It was a country that where uh, women si just simply appearing by the glass window, they were not allowed to do that. Forget about other things. They were. There was a country, there was no job, the, the, it was dying, the infrastructure was dead, uh, there was no national army, and a lot of the leaders or the factions fighting in the country simply, they claim power because they took part of, they took part in violence. They claimed leadership and power based on that. To looking at today where there is, you know, there are a lot of problems, let's, you know, not, not go into that, but it's a country completely transformed. It's a country that the youth are connected. They're making 70% of the population. They're connected through the internet, through the social media to the rest of the world. You have freedom of speech in the country, something that's completely unprecedented. 12 years ago or so, if you barely said anything ag against the regime, you would be thrown in jail or dead probably. To today where you just watch the Afghan talk shows on, on the media, and it's just incredible what people are talking about. There's a vibrant society ongoing. Uh, and, and, and their youth group, civil society, finally people are trying to do something. But what lacks a, in the country is political certainty. That's one key issue. And the other thing is that assurance from the international community that, you know, that we will stay with you. That two things are sort of holding the country on edge. If Afghans are assured of the fact that the international community stays with them, believe it or not, the rest, things have changed. They have reached to that tipping point where Afghans will push it to the next level. Mm -hmm. But they just need that assurance because of regional and so many other issues. So uh, Alliance in Support of the Afghan People is that organization asking for that assurance, asking the sustained engagement of the international community to be able to protect the gains that have been made over the last 13 years and to be able to move forward with that into mm -hmm. the future. Thank, thank, you thank you so very much. much. Well, thank you, all of you. We are 15 minutes over time. Uh, but it was worth it. And I want to thank Bilqis Ahmadi and Zora Rasekh and David Sedney for making this a valuable and rich conversation. Thank you. Okay.